Good morning and thank you once more for making it to this event. Ms. Timaruzi uh, Good morning, colleagues. Thank you for making time to be with us this morning. Um, my task this morning is very simple, is to uh, call upon our guest of honor, Honorable Chris Mtangwa, to come and make a presentation on this auspicious occasion. Thank you. Comrade Mtangwa. Say my microphone. You see, I don't have the interfering cell phone. Good morning, Mr. Mr. Journalists and uh, the electron electronic and media fraternity which is here. I want to honor my, the trustee of MISA, Mr. Maruzva, a, a seasoned pressman and a good friend for many, many years. And I also want to honor all the other members of MISA who are here. I want to say I feel honored, I'm humbled by the fact that you could in, uh, invite me. I of course, feel at home here. <laughs> yes, for uh, my, most of my life since the mid, the last quarter of the 70s and the, up to the 90s has been generally with the press world. And uh, some of the senior journalists, we remember each other from the Quill Club and from many other occasions, occasions of interaction. And so my days at ZBC as chief executive, they were, it was brief, but uh, uh, three years. That's, that's the first time I, I was fired by Mugabe in 1993-94. So I, I feel I belong. And uh, you do an important job in society, which is even more crucial now uh, since November. And uh, <clears throat> when there was a new dispensation, uh, I remember very well working with you very closely uh, during the, change, the big changes which came out in November. And uh, some of you, I think I started off in South Africa when I was briefly in semi exile or in exile uh, during the last days of the uh, <coughs> rule of, the, of Mugabe, his midwife, and the G4 courts. courts. I want to thank you very much for the role, the sterling role which you played in pushing forward that change. Was it, it did not been for the press, it would have been impossible to re realize the milestones which we did in November. And also it would have uh, put a new, twi a, a different twist to the events of November, but you kept the public informed, you kept the world informed, you kept generally anybody who was interested in the issue of Zimbabwe well informed. And uh, you may recall that we, the war veterans, uh, we actually temporarily took charge of all the press regulation, regulatory uh, issues in order to facilitate our change, the changes which we wanted to make. And uh, we actually posted people at the airport to make sure that all the journalists who were coming from abroad could be allowed to come into Zimbabwe because we could not rely on the ZBC at that time, uh, which was basically pandering as usual to Mugabe and what was the Zimbabwean state at that time. So you can say, you can appreciate why my, my gratitude to you is from deep down. You were so crucial to the events in November. And if you had not discharged that role, the history of the country would have been different, which just goes to underscore the importance of having a free press, which is the, the importance of having a free flow of information. I cannot be other than on the same page with you 
on that issue because you came to our rescue in November. Thank you very much. Uh, the topic today is to do with the free press and the elections, which are coming very soon. Uh, it's, a pro it's a process which is actually similar uh, to the events in November. It's going to be a change in the way the, gov the country is governed because the electorate will be expressing their will through the most important tool of governance in the world, which is the vote. There is no, there is no instrument or tool of governance which surpasses the vote. And the fact that the vote is crucial is actually of utmost importance and uh, because it is the expression of the people's will about whom or how they want to be governed. So it is, it is, it is, it is therefore of utmost importance that the vote is not only exercised but is seen to be exercised in a transparent and, uh, and accountable manner so that a voter freely expresses his or her will. And I'm glad to say that uh, uh, since the changes in November, our president has gone on record. He wants a free, transparent, credible, and fair election. This I'm paraphrasing President E.D. Mnangagwa. Uh, he was a beneficiary of the free press in November. He, the odds against him and what was the state presses owned by Mgabe would have been very much tilted you know, against him. He did not been for the free press. And I want to recount uh, what a few things which happened uh, during that occasion. I, I left Zimbabwe after we had organized the jeering of Grace in Bulawayo. And the, ta and the subsequent all-important tantrum of Mugabe, which finally exposed that there was no distinction between Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Uh, up to that stage, he had been hoodwinking the public, hoodwinking his uh, lieutenants, hoodwinking everybody to say that what his midwife was doing was his own agenda, which had nothing to do with him, and he, was, uh, he would sleep at these so-called uh, star rallies where uh, Grace was delivering vituperations against everybody left, right, and center. And Mugabe would pretend to be asleep. And from what I am told, when you ask him, he would say, oh, I, no, I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't challenge her because, you know, it would have been humiliating. She would have, uh, she would have humiliated or she would have... Uh, she would have uh, humiliated me in front of the public. So he was a clear and old man who was scared of his wife and he's running the state. Uh, but uh, we had to expose that what Grace was doing was a part of a shared agenda. Probably he was the author as a Machiavelli. So we then organized at the last ninth rally the jeering of Grace and this brought out Mr. Hyde from Dr. Jekyll, and events or subsequent events proved what, that he was on their side. He fired the president, and they were about to murder him with the G40, and the president, the, the present president, he had to flee the country. Uh, all I did was to wait to hear that he was safe. I was already in South Africa. I was always one step ahead, uh, because my information capacity is very good. <laughs> I... <laughs> Uh, for, for, I'm, I'm now a, a politician, I used to be a, I was a businessman, I've been many things. I've got a very varied, almost eclectic life. Yes. So one of the things which you learn during the war is that information must be good. And when I fought and I covered all the area from Nyanga to Norton to Mondoro during the war, it was very important that your information is good, your intelligence is good. Because your only defense against the Rhodesians in asymmetrical warfare, where they telecommunicate, where they had radio communication, helicopters, mobility, trucks, everything, bigger guns than we have, and even AK-47, is the trust which you get from the people you are fighting for and who are supporting you. 
So basically, I would say you are, this is at a pungwe. It was important for me within 15 to 30 seconds of getting to, a, to, to, to see a gathering, to see the faces <laughs> and notice the reaction so that you realize who could be a suspect or who, who is your supporter. It was very, very important. Because if you don't do that, before long, the helicopters will be on your, on your head and you are not aware. So uh, the cycle of information was very crucial. And it has taught me it was a matter of survival. So my intelligence uh, generally tends to be good about things. And um, the president, the, when I, once I heard that he was safe in, in, in Mozambique, I then called for a press conference in Santon, and all the major newspapers of the world came because they knew me, they trust me, the New York Times, the London Times, the, uh, the Le Point from Paris, all of them, I had a big press conference at the, at the Santon Towers. So you see again the role of the press, and I then announced that the president was safe. I'll tell you something which happened there. The president had consulted with the, Moza, with the South African hosts. And then uh, he sent a message to me to say that President Zuma, <laughs> he said that we, we should not hold a press conference because he doesn't want, the, he's handling a prickly diplomatic situation because Mugabe was still the president. Now I had all those journalists and I knew the importance of getting the world on my side. <laughs> You know how I replied? I told the emissary from the president that uh, go and tell him that you didn't see me. <laughs> so I proceeded to hold the press conference. So I thought he didn't, he wasn't aware. The other day we were going to Davos. He says, you, I told I gave you instruction to say that, don't, and you said somebody was, we're laughing about it. I said, Mr. President, at that time, you were not so much in control, the, 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 the world opinion was in control. I was seized to be accountable to you <laughs> as, 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 as my leader. I became accountable to the world press <laughs> so that the public, the world public would know what was going. In the event I held the press conference, I did a little other things, the, of which was to now give President Zuma the correct information that there had been no coup in Zimbabwe. The coup had long been carried out earlier by Grace. The military had not carried out a coup. They were just correcting the coup of Grace. And uh, I was in the nick of time, we arriving in Cape Town in midnight. He had his press statement issued at 11.30 in Parliament, no, parliamentary statement issued. So I started the briefings in South Africa at 8.15. Before 8, 8.30, before I could even finish the briefing, the advisor to the president says, excuse me, I'm rushing to parliament. I've got to go and correct, to give a correct version of events to the president, which he did. And the statement came out, and the president Zuma says, there's no coup in Zimbabwe. And uh, the instruction was given to his emissaries who were already in Zimbabwe, not to see Mugabe anymore, but and not go to Blue House, but go to State House and meet the generals first. So from that point on, the die was cast for Mugabe because South Africa literally realized that what their colleagues, the comrades, because we are, we are fellow fighters with the ANC during the war, what they done in Zimbabwe was the right thing. Now the whole G4 machinery, including Muzembe, they were lined up to go and try to convince Sadak that there had been a coup in Zimbabwe. Suddenly, so once South Africa takes a lead, you know South Africa is an important African country. Once they took a lead, that position collapsed. And it's a beauty because there is something which is the, 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 our, our rulers have always relied upon in, on Africa. You see, when you've got overwhelming force against your victims, you know, it's, it's inevitable that your victim will make a mistake. So, the, because in the 1980s, in the, in the 19th century, they had overwhelming force. You know, they, they, our people who were victims, who wouldn't have matching capacity to fight back, they then inevitably made mistakes. But the mistakes are that you are weak. But then the wise then say, 
the Africans are inherently stupid. So in Rhodesian, in the Rhodesian war, when they were training their soldiers, it was called the Kefa factor, that inevitably a black man will make a mistake to his disadvantage. And it was told to young white uh, recruits when they were being trained, they will be asking, they will be told, you are going to see your mother even after you have engaged with the terrorists in the bush. You will always survive to see your mother. Then the young white, white recruit would say, but what happens if I've run out of bullets and the, this terrorist has got a grenade and I have nothing? How do I come and see my mother? You know, because he will kill me. He's going to kill me. And the instructor would say, no, 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 no. There's the kefir factor which will help you. The terrorist will pull a grenade pin, keep the grenade for himself, and throw the pin at you. So it will explode at you. So this is the, 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 what they calculated on about the Zimbabwe events in November, that South Africa will inevitably make a mistake and say that there is a coup. Then it would justify what the IU was being told, then the United Nations would intervene, then the Americans would get a chance to intervene into the country or possibly turn the country into toast against a coup plotting generals. Because you know, the, uh, the maxim of the IU and the world is that there should be no, they, are, they don't tolerate military rulers. So it was very important that President Zuma gets it right. And I made sure he got it right that fateful day. And then I took, I plugged the sails. I took the wind off Muzambi henceforth. And the next day, I would fly back to Zimbabwe. And we then held the press conference, at which you all, well, most of you attended. She was there. And then we held another one, uh, calling on all the people of Zimbabwe to come for demonstration. That was not done by ZBC. It was done by the press. So you can see the important role which you played in the big match of all those people who came, the two million disciplined Zimbabweans who marched into Harare peacefully uh, without harming anybody, showing Zimbabwe's maturity in terms of politics. You were the messenger of that important message to the people of Zimbabwe. There you were discharging your role for democracy. What am I getting at? I am putting, this is a case study of a very successful role played by the press in making sure that the public is informed rightly and that the, and then he also communicated the message that we don't want anybody to come with regalia. You did it. We are doing it as all Zimbabweans. So you see, you are a very important contingent of the, of democracy, the fourth estate. You did a wonderful job and it will be, I'll be remiss if I don't use this occasion to miss her, to thank you, to thank you also on behalf of the war veterans, the Zimbabwean public, that you were the, a crucial player in the changes that came about. Of course, the state reverted to itself you know, once, the, once the changes had been done. Uh, there are still issues which I feel uncomfortable about. I, I, I believe in an unfettered free press, completely unfettered, uh, where there's a free play of ideas, and anything which hobbles the work of a journalist should really be shunted aside to make their job easier, because they are working to keep the mind properly informed so it can make the public make the right decisions about events surrounding them and the circumstances for surrounding them. So by, just by that nature, you can see that from a personal philosophy, secondly, from personal experience, and thirdly, from the recent events in the change, in the, of the changes which took place in the country, I am very much on the side of the press. Anything which stands in the way of you doing your job, I would want it removed out of the way. Uh, and uh, I'm glad moves have been have started in that direction because uh, uh, the G40 wanted a very, very constrained press. Because if you are going to make sure that a made woman succeeds clandestinely to power, you clearly do not want the public to be informed, a voting public. Because it would not be in your interest because they will challenge it like you did in November. So the G40 
he had an inherent uh, penchant for an uninformed press. They were anti-depressed because you, a, 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 an uninformed public is the best friend of dictatorship. And they were setting up a dictatorship. Initially, of course, Grace was the front of the dictatorship. Because I can never understand why supposedly a professor, why supposedly a lawyer who is a director general and now minister of justice of the Zimbabwe government, how, you know, we, uh, all the other cohorts of the G40 would ever entertain an unstable, a clinically unstable woman and, f you, and propia as, 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 a, as, as a leader of this country. I can never understand, unless you want to be, to do it in the, in the, in the, in the heat of darkness. And, that's, and darkness means an uninformed public. Because you, nobody, once the public was, an, an, was informed, Grace's fate was sealed. And this is why it is important to have a free press in a country. Uh, I would rather also entertain questions, uh, but I need to address other aspects. The free press now has got a serious competition from, from the internet, from the public, I mean the, the, <clears throat> the electronic, the, the internet and all that was the Facebooks and all the other part of, uh, anybody can now be a journalist. And there's a lot of bad information which is coming out now uh, from social media. And a lot of it could be orchestrated and you don't know because with the convergence of at, uh, artificial intelligence and information, it becomes very, very difficult to know which is the truth and which is not the truth. And the recent experience of Facebook, Facebook and Cambridge Analytica, where uh, a center somewhere in the world took data about American voters a select group of American voters who were opinion makers and used them, influenced them to swing the vote against Hillary Clinton in the last American elections, only shows the vagaries and the danger which can come out of the social media. Because those with powerful computers literally become the rulers of this information world. Then it threatens your role as journalists because you are now competing with what is basically fake news in your profession. This is something which you need to be very live to. That's why the issue of regulation becomes important with, the free, with, the, with social, social media. Uh, otherwise, people will be shepherded, will be flogged to do certain, frog marched to do certain things on the basis that it's a written word which has credibility. When the written word is actually being uh, generated on the basis of gathered intelligence, which is being synthesized and analyzed by a computer and then being directed, targeted at certain people. This is very dangerous a development against freedom. Mm. People don't want government regulation. And I would, I'm naturally, of course, uh, very careful about government regulation. But there is something worse than government regulation. It is regulation by a monopoly. <laughs> if you are now regulated by a monopoly acting for a certain shareholder, then you are in a worse position. At least a government is of elected people. And every five years, if you, the democracy is transparent, like what we aspire in July, like what the president has said, you will be assured that there is some kind of accountability. But Mr. What is his name? Huckabeck, Zuckerberg of, of, of of Facebook. He doesn't need to account to anybody except to his shareholders. And his marketing department has simply sold that information to those who wanted to influence American elections. Now you can imagine, American, generally Americans, they see themselves as the beacon of the free press. Now if that country is being manipulated by corporate interests, which have a certain ideological slant, then you can see the vulnerability which Zimbabwe could become. And I see it on Google. I don't know who is the editor of Google in Zimbabwe. The way Google presents information about Zimbabwe 
clearly shows that there is a hidden end. And because I'm very topical, and I say see, see my views, I see the way it is covered because I've spent all my life in the, in, 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 the, in the domain of the press. For those who are young people, I used to be the voice which you, your, your mothers listen to in Voice of Zimbabwe during the war. After I got wounded at the front, I ended up in Maputo after training as a journalist in, in Lusaka in 78, 77, 78. I trained with the Commonwealth Press Union. So I then ended up in the information publicity of the party and we became the communication channel to the fighting forces. The whole 30, 40,000, 50,000 of them in the field, they would be listening to the radio at 8 o'clock, and it was my voice and that of uh, Comrade Sobusa Gulandebele and that of Comrade Gray, among many other radios which we were doing, in, but ours was the most uh, active one, the most listened to. Uh, we were so successful that uh, the Rhodesian government introduced the FM Short wave, and to replace shortwave in order to stop the public from listening to us, to stop the guerrillas from getting messages through our radio system, which was in Maputo. So I've, I've been in this field long enough, you know, to, to know the circumstances of it. It's, uh, it's, 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 it's so important to give the world of reporters cut their integrity with all the jealous which can be mastered because you are, you are important. But the beauty is that there are so many of you who are varied, so there is no singular opinion. Unfortunately, of course, because of the manipulation of the press, uh, especially the private press, which is as guilty as the, as the public press in this country, you get the same stories originating from the, some kind of a hidden source being repeated over and over again. And there's no critical, you know, your role is being superseded by somebody else who has got editorial policy, who is directed from the owners of the newspaper to put a certain slant to certain news about what is going. In, fortunately, in the, in, by November, towards November, there was a change, and it was the private press which became the champion of the cause of change against the government press, which normally would have been, was, would, you know, all along, you know, I think at that time, the private press realized who were real the, the, the movers of change. Before, it was all veterans are evil. Uh, they, are, they, are, they are there to prop up Mugabe. They are like this, they are like this. So a stereotype, a caricature, had been made up of the war veterans. But somehow, in November, towards November, that changed. That's why we could enjoy so much of your support. You, were, you became our communication channel. I'm getting to say it's always important to review positions as pressmen because it's a dynamic change. What appears today is not necessarily what, what, what is there tomorrow. So the rapport which we created with you became very useful having of change. Uh, and that is the, the, the dynamism which we want because you don't want to fit into a, a stereotype or a caricature. We don't want atrophied journalism where you have the same thing over and over again. Unfortunately, Google never changes. I think Jonathan Moyo seems to be the editor behind Google in Zimbabwe. <laughs> I don't know, who, who, have you ever tried to establish who is in charge of writing the pages of Google in Zimbabwe? Have you ever tried? Do you realize it's important that you, 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 you find out that because this is, these are your competitors. They will make you irrelevant. You remember I told you about Cambridge Analytica and the way Facebook was abused. If you don't know who is behind the editing of the information of the most important channel of communication for Zimbabwe, who sifts, who, who, what is, who, when the news comes to the Google editor, what, how does that computer choose this story and not that one and post it? These are very, very important things because your, your species as journalists is threatened. They are the senders of fake information and they are competing against you. So be very conscious about that. I know this will be, you know, for those, I'm, I, I told you I'm very eclectic. 
I did programming during the war, towards the end of the war, right at the beginning. I then had a degree in IT from Boston University. I was the first one to introduce the modem in the country. I was the first one to introduce the CD-ROM in the country, all the digital media. I'm the pioneer, not Econet. I'm the pioneer of the, of the internet media. I was the first one to put these phones into the, even the exhibition at the Harare Agriculture Show in 1995, before everybody knew what were cell phones. I, I, I was working with Vodacom of South Africa at that time. I was also the first one to introduce the internet hub with Cisco from America. The PTC didn't even know what I was doing at that time. I, I told them I'm putting a voice, a, a data channel when they didn't, a, when they wanted, vo they didn't want a voice channel, they read one already. And I lied to the company that I was giving the PTC, the PTC a, 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 a voice channel because the company Sprint from America wanted a voice channel. So I said, you know, I'm putting a voice to the PTC, I said I'm putting data. That's how we got our internet hub. So I've been uh, generally, and the broadband, which is now Utande, for, for the payment system, I did it with a company from Montreal, Canada, called New Bridge Networks, which is now Alcatel. I know this world, I know, and then I went to China, where, of course, the Alibabas have emerged, where the Huawei's have emerged. So I know the world of information from inside out. It really poses a danger to you you probably need to collectively form an association as journalists where you push your own material on the internet collectively and then make a business case of yourselves. Because what you are selling is what you know, what you, 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 you already have the information, but you don't have an organized channel. If you do that very well, you will have quality stories coming out which defeat fake news. Then you can get advertising come to you because what moves Facebook is advertising. Why haven't you looked collectively as journalists at making a, an association of quality article reporting so that you defeat fake news, so that you become, you become the main source of reliable information? Because your, your, your species is threatened, I tell you, uh, by those who are behind, who can be the editor of Google in Zimbabwe. You will not survive against him. But if you, people want quality information, there's a natural drift into quality in society. If you collectively decide that you, you become the center point of quality information, advertising will follow you. This is particularly important in the new dispensation because the former regime was anti-capital. Jonathan Moore and Kasukwere, they believed that you could raise a, enough capital in high fields in Popoma, Sakuba, and Mkoba to go and build a power station like the Kariba South. That's what they believed. I was with them in cabinet. I was astounded. You know, you know the, because the difference between Lobengula, Mashayamombe, and Chingaira and Rhodes in the 1890s when we were occupied is that the roads at the backing of the London city and all the financial muscle of the world. You know, Bengula Mashayamombe did not know where, what was a financial market. So Rhodes could, so, could so, resource himself fast and played a decisive role, even though the numbers favored them. The war in Valangebech in, in Lalapans. In, in, in a couple of minutes, probably 5,000 to 10,000 of, of Lobengula's soldiers had been mowed down by a Maxim gun. Yeah, because that, that was the power of technology and the power of access to financing, which offset uh, the Asegai waving uh, uh, warriors of Lobengula. So the capital is very important. And the President Mnangagwa has come in to realize that we must make this country accessible to capital. There are huge investments which are going to be coming into this country because the population is capable, it's disciplined, it's educated. You will make good quality goods made in Zimbabwe like this one for the global market. And that's what excites those who invest. Can we make money in Zimbabwe? And President Mnangagwa is determined to make sure that business makes money in Zimbabwe. That's why there's the mantra open for business from President Mnangagwa. And it has resonated well with all the centers of capital from London to New York, to Shenzhen, to Singapore,
to Beijing, to Tokyo, to Seoul. You know, the hotels are full of business people. That's going to become the main, capital is going to be the main change agent of the new society. Now, though, that creates all sorts of opportunities for you, particularly because your population, the population is educated. We can deal with information better than anybody in Africa because of our higher levels of education. So look at your business case. Just don't look at writing the story. Because if you don't make a business case of yourself, you write yourself to poverty. <laughs> and when you write yourself to poverty, you become extinct. You know why the war veterans fared so badly? They were too late to realize that Mugabe did not mean well for them. Can you imagine uh, the war veterans they fought in the 70s. Uh, there was an interview carried out by Father Prof, Prof, Prosa when we were already in Mozambique. I was at St. Augustine's and then went to, I went to University of Rhodesia then. Then I heard him now when I was in Mozambique. And he, he was being interviewed by the BBC why so many students were leaving class to go to war. And Father Prosa, he rest in peace, he died three or four years ago. He says, well, I cannot give a reason because I, I, he was a foreigner, but he was teaching black students at St. Augustine's. I cannot give a reason as to why they went to war. But what I can tell you is that the best and the brightest are the ones who are leaving class to go to war. That's my generation. And that's why within less than five years, although we'd never seen a gun before, we went to Romania and all over the world. We mastered the military arts and closed the gap between us and Rhodesia to defeat in a mere five years. That's a particularly steep learning curve. And we did it at great cost in a very short period of time. Now, that, 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 that is my generation, you know, how we can master technology, how we could master technology. I'm saying it is not beyond you to also do the same, so that we master the, because technology levels the playing field. Once the internet is there, it is there for everybody. It is also there for you. So it's very important that you send, you go for quality information. I just want to add another aspect concerning the war veterans. In 1980, we came back from the war. Mugabe said, we said to President, to Prime Minister Mugabe, we want everybody to go to school. Because that's what we told people during the war. Mugabe came after consulting with J.C. Zero, his Minister of Finance. He came back and says, look, this is the budget. The budget, we are coming out of war, there's no money for people to what? To all go to school. Do you know what we told him? We told him that you use your budget to, to pay teachers. We are going to organize the parents, the people, the same way we organized during the war. These people I told you were the steep learning curve to build schools. So the whole country became a huge building uh, society of parents. Each village competing against the other village to build schools because you'll be rewarded with a teacher from Harare. So there was a huge competition among these villages. That's why we've got everyone who went to school. No African country can achieve that feat because the hardware was built by the parents. Do you know there was a race between the government and the, and the, and the parents the government lost it had to make a new plan. And again, we, the answer came from the war veterans. We said, we go to Cuba, we turn our former military camps into teacher training schools. We trained 6,000 teachers in Cuba. And they then came back. That's when there was a catch up. But for Mugabe, he never wanted to reward the entrepreneurial, the creative flair of the war veterans. I am different from many of the other war veterans because I was fired, like I told you. When I was fired, I fended for myself. I spent a whole year, Davidson knows, and she, you know it. I spent two years in Gokwe selling maize to survive until this industry came. Then some South African guys who had seen me at ZBC with Bob TV, they went to form Vodacom with the new digital technology. They came looking for me in Gokwe. 
So I ended up being a telecommunication consultant because they had remembered me from the, they said, oh, that guy, he understands this. He's a, he had a, an, an IT qualification of Boston University. I initially refused to go because I said, I had no influence. I've been fired. I can't get you a license for Vodacom. But they then gave me a, a first, I mean, a business class ticket. They gave me a voucher for the Santon Towers Hotel. They gave me a voucher for a car hire and it was delivered to me in Gokwe by my wife. She says, you are refusing to go, but these guys, they seem to have so much faith in you. Sure enough, I put on my old diplomatic suit. It was now so big because I'd lost weight. <laughs> <laughs> I flew into Jobek, and I was in Sandon Towers, and the next Monday, I was seeing the, chief, the chairman of Vodacom. He just says, we are giving you this contract. You, are, you know, you go and get us a license in Zimbabwe. That's how I came back to be what I am today. And because I did all those other projects which I told you about, I made a lot of money for myself. Not from government, but not as good as your government, not with me. I made my own money. I was the father of the dot com, the digital era in Zimbabwe. But what it did is it gave me the freedom not to be afraid of losing Mugabe's paycheck. <laughs> Because all the other war veterans, they were foot dragging, those who were in the army and everywhere, they were foot dragging about challenging Mugabe because they were not sure about what would happen to them at the end of the month if there's no paycheck. I was free of that. Hey, by the time I went to China, I was already, I was already well established as a businessman. I only went there because Mugabe drafted me because the British were threatening him. So he wanted another set of capital. And when he wanted to send me to Berlin, because the Anglo-American had influenced the, the government here, it's a monopoly, you know? They had influenced the government to remove me from Beijing so that they, they, I don't raise the competition from the Chinese. I refused to go to Germany. And people wondered, how can I refuse an ambassadorship? How will I survive? I told him, Gabi, I don't need your check. So I came back home in 2007. And I can tell you from 2007, to pretty much 2013, when I went back to government to sell it after winning the elections, I didn't care because I had my own freedom. So when I told you about trying to combine your profession with earning money, you are being told from somebody, Agava Murutsa. Yeah, but the sad thing is that if I could be different because I was fired, all the other war veterans have remained destitute to this day, 37 years later, only for Mugabe to start disdainfully remarking to them that your time is up. It's now Kasukwere's time, it is Wao's time, because they are younger than you. They had not been given, they, they had anticipated that the country will give them a chance to have the same creativity and use it so that they can also improve the lot of the country like they did with education but they remained in the social realm, like you are doing, writing for the sake of society to be okay. But they forgot that they also needed their own well-being to be well catered for until wounds came about and carried out that demonstration. It's so important in your profession that you must think about where you will be when you retire. To nest poverty around yourself and forego opportunities which may arise because of your talent as reporters, is to make a very grievous mistake about yourself and your duty to your family and to your society in the end. Because you will not be able to save society that well. That's why everybody is vulnerable to, blue, to some envelope. You get some money, you know, you did the right thing. So there's no more. You are now a purveyor of false news because you want to, to get your next cup of, of coffee. That's very sad. So on that good note, I want to entertain questions. Thank you. <laughs> you can see I was, I was, I didn't come with a prepared speech. You don't go to your friends with a prepared speech. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you, thank you, Ambassador, for your uh, We now, oh, I thought my voice. Thank you, Ambassador, for your enlightening remarks. It is now your opportunity, colleagues, to pose a few 
questions in the interest of time because uh, the ambassador advised, advised me earlier that uh, he is uh, to rush somewhere else. So if you can uh, raise five very critical burning issues in the context of media reforms now, and maybe then thereafter for those that have other questions outside the, the media reforms now agenda, you can always then uh, uh, follow the ambassador on his way out. So, <laughs> come for ambassador. yes, and if you can identify yourself as you put your question to the ambassador. Um, you know, love for the media. Yeah. Uh, in your own opinion, why is it the government, even the current administration, seems to be a bit reluctant in uh, um, embarking on uh, reforms? Some of it may not need uh, much effort in terms of uh, uh, reforms that are needed to uh, have uh, a better working environment or even a, a vibrant media, particularly if you look at um, the issue of uh, community radio stations. Can I quickly answer this one? Yeah. You see, what I've learned, and since this is why I had to leave school in the 70s to go to war, there's no free lunch. If you expect that there will be a largesse from somebody who has got a vested interest in, in current circumstances, and you sit back, waiting, sit back waiting for him to deliver that largesse to you, you make a mistake. That's what we, the war veterans, refused about Mugabe. And it comes, there's no free lunch. Anything which is given for free, there's something wrong. It must be, it should be, you know, count, you know be very careful what you've been given for free. Things are fought for. You understand? Things are simply fought for. You've got to get organized so that you fight for the env environment which you want. If you expect somebody else who is a bureaucrat somewhere else to do things for your benefit when you are the one who is at the bending end of the stick, then you are making a mistake. You fight for things. I don't understand why it cannot be done that way. I simply don't understand. And I'm speaking not as a special advisor to the president. I'm speaking for somebody who always, always wanted a what? A free press. You've got to fight and get what deserves. Anything which is given for free, it's probably not worth it. I, do, I hope I've answered you. Larry Kwiderai, uh, through mob.com and ZFM Stereo. My question is on uh, social media regu regulation. Is that coming uh, very soon for a certainty? I need a very straight answer on that one. And then secondly, there's certain things that were they say, like things like, uh, you know, you've talked about the editor of Google and so forth and knowing how Google algorithms, algorithms work and so forth. Mm -hmm. It's public information. Now, with certain what somebody would call inaccuracies about how technology works, how confident can we be that some of these uh, regulations that may or may not be coming will be uh, handled properly? Yeah, again, same answer. Why do you want the regulations to be set somewhere where you are not there? Um, yeah. You said, uh, just, your, uh, yeah. just using your, your specific words, yeah. uh, that's why there's going to be a need to uh, uh, what you call it, to regulate social media because it's a danger to the press, you say. Yes. And then at the same time, you say it's better to be re regulated by the government because it's elected as opposed to being regulated by monopoly, your specific words. Yes, yes. So the question becoming, is the government, because it believes that it has the interests of the people, going to regulate so, uh, social media given that it has implications on free speech? No, I, 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 you know, there's a minister of the ICT is in charge of that. There's a Minister of Information. So I'm not speaking on their behalf. I, I'm speaking on behalf of my own historical experience to say that this thing is better to be regulated by government because periodically people go for an election. That's why it is also, uh, by, 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 by extension, very important to have 
a democratic government which is accountable because that ensures that the dynamics in society are constantly reviewed so that as the world changes so fast, you adopt quickly and accordingly. You know the American Congress now, they are busy in the British Parliament, they are busy trying to review social media after what happened at Cambridge Analytica. You understand? Because these are governments who are taking charge. So it is important. The Chinese government continuously reviews its regulatory framework to make sure that they insulate themselves from the Googles of this world. Maybe it's better to have, for them, it's better to have a regulation from the communist part of China because it caters for the patriotic interests of the Chinese than to have Mr. Zuckerberg do it for their behalf because he does it for, the, for his own corporate interests. And you could see how Zuckerberg says, I'm sorry. I mean, you are a man in charge of a billion, about a billion dollar company which is abusing even the elections in the United States, and all you can say is, I'm sorry. Isn't that pathetic? That's pathetic. So you've got to understand, but, but you know, the, on the other hand, you say regulation, and then you want to say it should be left to government. That's why I say there's no free lunch. You are all smart people here. Why not carry out, become a movement? You end regulator of the framework. All the information is available on the internet. Why do you want some bureaucrat in the ministry to call the shots on something which, and he probably doesn't read as much as you, and you want that person? That's what happened, you know, in the last 20 years of Mugabe. We had Nikam Poops in cabinet, and everybody. <laughs> the day you shall read the minutes of Mugabe's cabinet, that's when you realize that the country was on a precipice. I couldn't believe it going into that cabinet. Crass ignorance of the West order running a modern country. And all of you waiting every Tuesday, you know, saying, Kudu kwa Buddha cabinet, I was inside. I was appalled. I couldn't believe it. Kuti, this is how a modern country is run. So don't create fetishes out of centers of power. <laughs> don't create fetishes out of centers of power. Because, you, you, you know, you go this, and everybody says, ah, my old veteran, my guerrilla. It's your duty as citizens to change your government. Hey, I'll die in the historical experience of changing your governments will go away with me. Then the next time Kasukwere comes when I'm not there, then you will be ruled by Nikampap. Um, uh, Mr. Mtongwa, you, you, you mentioned something about uh, government regulation being better than uh, monopoly regulation. I said it's, uh, the, it's, it's the lesser evil. It's a lesser evil, yes. yes. Uh, uh, but uh, as we look into our own situation where we see monopolies taking over, particularly in the telecoms industry and with the conversions of uh, uh, media also being closely uh, working with uh, uh, these telecoms companies. Uh, is there anything government is uh, doing to try and uh, stop these monopolies as they are uh, clearly a threat to the freedom of the media? Again, I would write, you, you know, one put it to parliament. That's why the parliament, those are the people, those are your representatives. That's why they must be democratically elected. You should make the th parliamentary be informed so that the issues which are raised now are put on the agent of change in a country, which is parliament. Uh, there is a belief here that these things should be done by minister and bureaucrats. That's a mistake. The people who change things is parliament. So you should be organizing yourselves on media issues that the parliamentarians are informed. You lobby them to say these are the dangers we face because they are the ones who pass laws, not, you know, not bureaucrats. Bureaucrats, they will not do anything. Look, they all worshipped Mugabe when the country was atrophy. Bureaucrats <laughs> are innately incapable of change. I have got so much problems, you know, because if you don't, if you don't most of the, the, the Revenue ash, uh, avenues of this government, I was behind them. The tobacco sector, I revived the tobacco sector, 600 million US dollars every season. When the op they open in February, Mangunja smells. When they close in September, he swoons. Because 
in the, I, 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 that's an industry which I revived in China. I wish I was a private businessman. I would probably be bigger than anybody in this country, but I did it as, a, as, a, as an ambassador. The gold sector, you all remember, Makorogoza, I mean, yet this country has been historically built by gold. All the great Zimbabwe, Kami, Rolo, they were built by gold trading. We were the biggest gold producing country in the 13th century, Zimbabwe. That's where we, we built other African countries built of grass thatch and, and dagger, and it all got burnt. Zimbabwe built with granite. That's where it is there. We we're very, very remarkable as a, as, a, as a culture. That was driven by gold trade, controlling all the ports. Now, the colonial government stops gold trading, I mean, gold mining for the, our people. Well, you know, they were being hunted when the Udawita Wunga were food can all when you were smelting in the mountains. So a whole ten, nine decades, our people were not involved in gold. We inherited that system. Then we start chasing, uh, harassing the, the Makorokos. I mean, we were perpetuating. The bureaucrat thought it was the right thing to do because the law was written by the colonials. You understand? And the policeman is enforcing that law, which is inherently by origin against we as a people. You understand the dangers of relying on government HRT Chinjirayari, government HRT Chinjirayari. No, things don't work out that way. I want to go further. So I then was at MMCZ. I pushed that Magpanas, Vasai to be harassed. And now they are contributing the second most important revenue stream after, and one which is all season, unlike the tobacco, which is seasonal. Chrome, I went into cabinet. People were not selling chrome. I said, do you realize that the railway line, the only internal railway line this country built, as opposed to those which are going to the coast, followed the Great Dyke from Shamva to Gwanda. That's the Great Dyke. Do you know why it was built? To follow chrome. Why? Because you see this building. It's brick, cement, and steel. What is steel? 30% chrome. So you, in, you realize the importance of chrome. And Zimbabwe is the best endowed in the world for 600 kilometers of chrome. G40, under the influence of uh, the whites and under the influence of the NGG indigenization, some stupid you know, organizations run by people who have never been to school. The indigenization, indigenized. They ban the sale of chrome. Why? Because we want to force the Chinese to build smelters. And we are exporting both, uh, uh, jobs to China. Guys, I garapas. So we are now handling chrome the same way our pre-human beings, the uh, apes, were handling chrome. Yagango gar, iripa great dike. Do you know what was the economic impact of it? The railway line carries load. There is no other source of load in this country except minerals. You can't carry grain with railway line profitable. So the day we stopped selling chrome, the day we killed the railway line. So from 18 million, we reduced to 4 million. Because the most important commodity which the world wants is no longer being traded. I'm in China. I'm seeing two cities, Harare, built every month. You know what? That's what China does. Every month it builds two Harares. You can imagine the amount of steel. It, every month, the building, the, the ports, the harbors, all those. And I'm working up as an ambassador, and there's no ounce of Zimbabwean chrome in those buildings. Now everybody comes here and says we are poor. You are poor by choice, by the stupidity of the G14 parliament and cabinet. I then went to the cabinet, and the, the senior old man who is sleeping all the time, shouting at me that I am a Chinese puppet. I said, Chinese puppet for poverty. So eventually the chrome ore was opened two years ago, you remember? Now we go along the Great Dyke, young men are busy digging. Because we've always been minor, miners. I'll tell you another story. Do you know what white miners ex who have got gold claims were called in the 1980s of the 1890s? They were called, they were called blanket explorers. Go and check that tape. You see, the company was in charge of the country, Rhodes Company, BSA. They came from Johannesburg with they came and saw where our people were smelting gold. They then said, we are no longer allowing you to mine. So you, are, you, can't, you don't need the mine anymore. So the guy was then 
asked to indicate where the mine is, they were given blankets in return. This mine has been in Africa, a Shona or Ndebele mine for, 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 family, for centuries. It surrendered to a white man. In return for a blanket. So there was a big market for blankets in Johannesburg, because that was the headquarters. People, white people now registering their mines. And then the guys who are selling blankets say, why are you in the blankets? He says, that is the way we go and get mines in Zimbabwe. Because the commissioner would say, why should I register your mine? I, how do you know that there is gold? He says, no, there is gold because this is an old mine which was being mined by the Shona and the Bede people. So they were now called blanket explorers. That, that's why there's blanket mine in Blawai. You see, you need to understand this. Now, <laughs> now, 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 now you see, this is the history of our country. Now you are against those Makorokosa. When, that's why you are destroying the economy. Can we, now everybody is busy. Now we are selling chrome. That's a chrome mining area. I'm so excited. This is the Zimbabweans at work. So it's very important to understand that a bureaucracy never does something which is in your favor. Because uh, it's at, it atrophies. But, and that's, that's how the government of Mugabe atrophied. And that's how the, the whites then controlled the device. They had to square no sugar up. All they needed to do was to read the minutes. Then they knew they were, the country was they were in charge. That's why they said, if this country can be run by such, then even a made woman, a clinically made woman can be in charge. Because they were reading the minutes of the cabinet. They said, Tatora Ganyik. And we, the war veterans, had to intervene to say, no, things ain't done that way. It is very important because we are playing a role of democratizing the country. And, and President Mnangagwa, is the, is, he has put it on record that he wants you to have open space. Don't say he was, he has put the words, therefore it is done. Honorara, you have to work for it. There's no free lunch. Yes. And that's the so. I can take two, then do and end, or three. No, 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 answer one. I'll try to be short sure this time because I have to go. So for me, in one fell swoop, and then I can respond to the question. Can somebody write to me just quickly so that? Because I don't want to write and be, as they ask. Uh, quick annotation. My question relates to the issues where you spoke about. Uh, the Zimbabwe being open for business and uh, capital, that uh, we need investment in capital. And we have seen what the world, what is happening in the world where we have this uh, uh, monopoly capital. And uh, specifically in the media industry, we have seen what uh, monopoly capital can do, especially in relation to the cost of data in, in this uh, age of uh, Internet of Things. And most people in Zimbabwe cannot even afford to be on uh, on internet because of the prohibitive uh, yeah, data come, status. Come the question, just go to the question. So the question is, as a as an advisor to the president, mm -hmm. uh, what is the government going to do to make sure that most Zimbabweans can access this uh, public utility, the data and internet services? Thank you. My name is Donald Mukota from Capital 100.4 FM. Uh, media and elections. The first thing that I want to ask is, um, so ED is on record saying that we are going to have free, fair and credible elections in Zimbabwe. Um, they just ended ZANPF primary elections. We have had uh, conflicting reports. Would you say they were free, fair and credible? And uh, secondly, just so that um, I just want to then thank you also for saying that uh, we played an important role during the 2017 events by reporting accurately. Now, we also want to report accurately. In terms of um, the just-ended elections, were you really beaten in the Northern by election, and what are the figures? Thank you. Now, now can I answer this too, together? <laughs> because otherwise, the first one about the cost of data, it's that's why it is important to have a, a, a deregulated market. You see, in the 1930s, only the government could afford to build a PTC. 
because the business model at that time was such that no individual uh, player could raise capital to put, put a telecommunications line or to put a power station. But with technological advantage, the business model has changed. Many more people can get into the threshold of entry into the what were traditionally so-called reserved sectors of government. They were not reserved because the government wanted them. They were reserved because no businessmen wanted them, but the service was required. Now the threshold of entry has been lowered. We should just have more players in the internet field because the, the cost of data is not a function of the government putting a price. The cost of data is creating an investment climate where many players come in and compete and push down the cost. The reason why soap in one shop is not more expensive than in another shop is because they are afraid of the competition, because there are many players producing what? Soap. So for me, the more the merrier, and the threshold of technology is such that it has lowered the, the, the capital costs required to set it up. And then two, of course, the government needs to regulate. Uh, one of the reasons why the, you know, because the monopoly is usually tied to control of the, of the channel. Everybody wants to put a data mast in the country. It's like building four railway lines to go to Bulawayo from Harare, each one built by a different company. It does not make sense. The mast should become public property. Then people come and put their dishes there. Then the cost of data will be, because all you do, the mast is already there. Why does Econet build, an, you know, build a mast next to one built by Net1, next to one built by, uh, uh, it does not make sense. You are building four, four, railways, four railways to go to Blawayo without increasing the traffic on the railway line. So you are impoverishing the industry, you are killing the industry. But what does it do? It creates a monopoly because of mass. Then it raises the price of data to you. These are the things which you need to read. As we are, as we are talking about it, you need to go and go to the parliament and go to the parliament. And you need to inform the public. I have to say that I have to say that I have a special advisor to the president. I will spend moving from office to office, then everybody hates me for trying to push progress because nobody is thinking at the same page as I am. Then it's my task becomes impossible. <laughs> eh. So you need, to, you need to go to parliament. Eh. You need to go to parliament, inform the public. That's why I said in association of you, because these things are in your interest. Muchaparara me se mnema monopoli zae, magunzi, di nyore resu and dinoda, kana otelara kumba ndoku pa story, ndoku pa mai. Then you are finished. It's in your interest, guys. Not only the elections, they were just so disorganized. I'm sorry, and there was so much infiltration by the G40. You know, I will tell you my story. And I'm a candidate for Norton. I had to go to Norton because of all urban constituencies in this country, there is now constituents as smart as Norton. And it's a matter of record. Uh, when Mugabe fired me, without consulting them, they, 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 they were miffed, and they repaid him by giving him an independent candidate. That's a, that, was the first, that was the first banana slip from Mugabe, the Norton constituents. Now, there are 30,000 of them who are supposed to vote. A result is announced late this morning, less than 4,000 have voted. All the people were being turned away. Why? Because Temba Muliswa want a weak candidate. And it's on record, and I internet. And Mchangwa Kapinda and Ngawi Nimuna November. Now you see, these are people whom you are trying to champion as your future. And Zdoa Norbi Sazanu PF. That man is just a charlatan and a fascist. He is, he is deliberately working with not only his a choose a competent candidate so that when he goes to the national elections, he will have a weak candidate which he defeats. Then he, he organizes the police force. They were going to retaining officers. All of them bribed. There are only 14, 15 stations. It's very easy to bribe all of them. And all of them turn away voters. They the list against my shamu. And everyone knows the history of shamu and my shamu. So they put their list in the polling booths. The policeman is paid. Remember, I'm saying in a card or in a registration, they are all being turned away. The queues were huge the first day, probably up to 10,000 people. You saw the queues. They were huge. Out of all those huge queues, only 4,000, I said, you don't have voter. 
Now you want to say that's democracy. He has infiltrated the party because he gamma talks. He's working with the police. He's working with Webster Shamu. He's working with Gansi because they have a revenge. Gunzi Mchangwa got to understand and Namuchi Mchedu till G40 and yeah. So you see, again, you know, I, I I'm going to make sure that the Northern electorate is not is 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 not shortchanged because that's democracy. I between my duty to Zanu PF and my duty to the election, election to the Norton electorate, my duty is to the Norton electorate. Because they are supreme, the vote is supreme, not ZANU PF is supreme. So I'm going to fight to make sure that ZANU PF aligns itself with the electorate. So that ma 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 you know in a nascent fascist you know putating putating fascists like Temba are not allowed to 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 to, to become your rulers. This is another Jonas I need to make yeah. You can see his mentality. They, you know, he wants to be the bully in town. He goes to parliament, he calls this one left, right, and send it. And then he says, and I'm, I'm making the people accountable for this, for that. Building a career on a shame crusade <laughs> of being a populist. We have seen it all, my war veterans. I know in a village who is a threat and who is not. Otherwise, I don't survive. So uh, it's game on. Don't worry. Yeah, we will not, I will, the, the, the main point is that I will not allow the Norton electorate to be shortchanged by putating fascists. And if ZANU PF, if ZANU PF, ZANU PF will make it rise to the occasion. Remember, it was failing before in Nenyama G4, and we, the war veterans, tweaked it to live up to what it should be. Because that's what we know. I said I will not let the electorate of Norton's wishes be shortchanged by, by putating fascists. That's enough. <laughs> thank, Sorry, thank. I'm, uh, I have to make this announcement. I'm advised that our papers are getting closed. Oh, yeah. So, time, also, I'm rescue going, me. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm just going to allow two very oh. good questions from Mr. Yamtumbu, <laughs> Vice Chairperson of Mr. Zimbabwe, and lastly yourself. Just be <laughs> yes, 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 thank you, Comrade Mchangwa. You know, if it were not for AIPA, we would have uh, perhaps had access to the minutes uh, that you really allude to. Uh, but is there consensus in government around issues, Yama, Yama reforms? Because the but president, on one please, end. Please, 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 please. I've been here for some time hammering the same point. Yeah, you, know, you know, things are worked for, there's no free lunch. Yeah, you are saying there's no consensus, there is a consensus. Maybe the word consensus doesn't even exist. People are not even thinking about that. Why do you assume that people are consciously thinking about what you want? You've got to make them think about what you want. That's why they're accountable officers. That's why it's so important to have democracy. Use the systems. Don't ask me. Ask your member of parliament. I'm not your member of parliament. <laughs> 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 what? No, no. Yeah. As the special advisor to the president, we will also use this opportunity to say I was in this breakfast meeting, and this no, is what no, the journalists no. are saying. No. Look, <laughs> no the, uh, <laughs> let me put it this way: to go and sleep on your job, on what should be of your interest, because I come here to address you, because the Runa special advisor, Motima Wina, Dog Pusaiko. Because the agents of change in a country are many, and they need to be constantly tweaked, those agents of change. And ultimately, it has to be in parliament, but not only parliament, the oversight of parliament to make sure that what you are asking for is done. If you wait, you see, it's like I told you, but it's your duty as a citizen, as a responsibility to say you must fight for focus against this thing. That's why I said with teacher for my war veteran. I'm now 60 years old, I'm wet here. I was tired and I was tired and I was tired. I was going to take you for lunch and breakfast at the same time. And you know, until we had to come, I'm doing it for the second time around because my general would know it was somewhere. Please internalize your democracy and make it work. I'm 
Ambassador, uh, it's not like as journalists we have not done anything. We have uh, demonstrated, we have lobbied government, we have lobbied parliament. And you keep on emphasizing on the need to fight for our freedoms. Yes. What other forms of fighting do you think your government, which you are part of, would understand? Besides what we have done already. No. Just you advise to us. The most important dictum of guerrilla warfare is know your enemy. You understand? Know your enemy. You got to know the adversary. It's up to you to study and to devise ways of how you can make your message go through. Nobody knows better your, your situation than yourself. And you, if you are not yet able to see how you can make change yourself, then you are not yet ready to be asking the question which you are doing. In Buenda, Isusu, when it came, could it anesco and aggress Kumao veterans? Not only did we identify with what was wrong with the G14 Nechi, we then worked the appropriate means to make sure that they are removed. And today they are removed. That's what we did with Ian Smith. So again, this sleepy attitude, it's wrong. You must find ways of making sure that you deliver, you get a solution which you want. If you cannot devise or you don't know the solution which you want, or you don't know how to get, way, to, get to that solution, then you haven't started. Don't try to make your work my work. Don't try to make your work my work. It's your work. Yeah, Honorable, Honorable Mchangwa, coming to what uh, we've gathered here for on the issue of um, uh, Press Freedom Day, how much do you respect uh, uh, freedom of expression, considering that uh, some of us work for SABC, and uh, you don't now seem to want to talk to SABC because uh, they interviewed uh, Jonathan Moy and they've cut us off? I also have to have my freedom of choice as to who I give an interview to. Yeah. I mean, if, you, if you decided to promote him and then you want me to come and promote to come to make a justing match, I don't see, the, I've not seen any advantage of trying to talk to you. When there was, when there was a useful, you know, I got, I got to do things which have, which have a reward for me. When there was an issue about G40, and I wanted them out, and you were part to what I wanted, of course. It's a market car. Hey, what, 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 what do you save me? But, you know, I, I've got to see value in trying to give you an interview. You haven't convinced me that there's any value in you giving me an interview. I don't. But the day I see value in you giving, me, in giving an interview to you, I, you will not even phone me. I'll phone you. <laughs> so it's value. It's a market. Thank, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. I'm sure you will be willing to take your, your questions. And on this note, I want to uh, thank you, Ambassador, on behalf of uh, uh, Mr. Zimbabwe. In the meantime, but, uh, I now want to invite the, the, the Mr. Zimbabwe trustee, Mr. Marujua, just to for, formally thank you. But thereafter, breakfast is served, and it shall be the Ambassador, the Mr. Zimbabwe the <coughs> trustee, the board members first. These are the ladies and gentlemen that are seated at these uh, tables, and then everybody else will, will follow thereafter. Thank you once more. Well, thank you very much, Ambassador Sangwa. Um, I think thank you very much for your comments. I think we'll take note of them. I think on our on our side, we've done quite a lot of things in terms of actually providing model laws on what the government should do. But yes, we hear you. We'll continue to lobby the MPs and the Parliamentary Committee on, on media to, in order to actually bring about change. But thank you very much. I think for your comments were very instructive. You came to our rescue. That was what you said. You became our channel of communication, and that ED was a beneficiary of our free press. I hope you will take this message back, because I think if you have people who have that kind of appreciation, then we believe that our struggle to actually create a free and fair and democratic environment for the press is much easier. Thank you very much.
we will uh, as soon as we sorry uh, as soon as we dish uh, hello ladies and gentlemen sorry ladies and gentlemen as soon as we dish our breakfast then we can come back into this room and then we'll reconvene with uh, the reading of Babangweso. Apana Shati.